Did you know that Squarespace are offering a free trial and 10% off your first purchase if you use our discount code? Squarespace.com forward slash TrekCulture. What are you waiting for? Do you get it? Do you get it? Yeah, you kind of had to be there. In jokes are often fun if you're on the in of them, forgive the pun, whereas if you are not, they can be about as much fun as dry rot. None of these actually count as that though. Dry rot, I mean, they all count as in jokes. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 greatest Star Trek in jokes. Number 10, 47. 47 is 42, corrected for inflation. Executive producer Rick Berman once joked, the ultimate answer might cost you more in Star Trek, but what is the question? Well, have you ever wondered why Ronan in Sub Rosa, Sex Ghost, said he was born in 1647, why shields were often down to 47%, or why Captain Janeway was really from Bloomington, Indiana? The reason is writer Joe Minoski, who began his Star Trek career in season four of The Next Generation and has worked on Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Discovery. Minoski graduated from California's Pomona College, which apart from excelling in the liberal arts, is known for having a thing for 47. The college even has a club dedicated to the number, the 47 Society, that Minoski was part of as a student. He then brought this university in-joke into Star Trek, and it has stuck with the writers ever since. Bloomington, Indiana, zip codes 47401-47408, is more properly an homage to Voyager producer Jerry Taylor, who was born there, but there are pages of other examples of the 47 phenomenon. Here are just a small few. In Family, Picard is given the 47 vintage. In Conundrum, there are 47 Lysian sentry pods. In DS9, pads are often labelled 4747 and weapons lockers 47. In Voyager, the temporal variance of the Cranum Chronoton torpedo is 1.47 microseconds and I have just needed between 4 to 7 Aldebaran whiskies. Number 9. Some kinds of Star Trek. Rarely is anything more meta than the time Star Trek looked through a telescope and saw itself. Star Trek First Contact is one big self-reference, a trek to the past to ensure its own future. Zephram Cochran needs some kind of Star Trek as much as it needs him. In that film, First Contact gets a direct nod, although that was far from the first or last movie or episode title name drop and dialogue. They toasted the undiscovered country in The Undiscovered Country, and Captain Janeway provided a counterpoint, counterpoint in Counterpoint, amongst many other examples. Star Trek is also more subtly self-referential at times. In The Next Generation's 80th episode, Legacy, the Enterprise D has to bypass an archaeological survey of Camus II, which happens to be the last planet visited by another Enterprise in its 79th and final episode. Yes, we are counting them like that. According to the Star Trek Encyclopedia, the Camus II mention was a deliberate tip of the hat to turnabout intruder on the part of Rick Berman, Jonathan Frakes, and producer Eric Stilwell. Of course, the end of the the beginning of this kind of Star Trek is a prophecy of itself. We've only postponed the invasion until, what, the 24th century? Number 8. Commerce Seals and Blaine's Twin Brother our lovely writer Jack has already discussed television's demise in Star Trek, but it deserves a second mention here. Beyond the canonical prediction, the medium didn't last much past 2040, for humanity at least, the writers clearly take great delight in having assigned television to the history books. It's the perfect in-joke. By relying on a lack of awareness of the characters, the writers can poke fun at their own industry without having to totally demolish that fourth wall. The gag is perhaps also a gentle reminder to appreciate Star Trek for what it ultimately is, a piece of television. For as long as we have it. After all, in Star Trek, nobody's watching Star Trek. After Data's revelation in the neutral zone, there have been a few direct references to TV. When Voyager went back to the 90s, Kess and Neelix were tasked with reviewing Earth broadcasts and became addicted to the soap opera. We still don't know if Blaine's twin brother was the father of Jessica's baby. More recently, spoiler alert, in Lower Decks, Boimler got hilariously hooked on Ferengi television, ironically unfamiliar with the commercials. Commerce Seals? And the serial drama, Cop Landlords needs its own spin-off. Moreover, the title of that Lower Decks episode was itself a TV reference. Number seven, Riker. I mean, how could we not? There are plenty of reasons to love Lower Decks, and top amongst them are the Easter eggs, in-jokes, and altogether weirdly specific references. In a similar vein, Strange New Worlds has delighted fans by returning to the roots of Star Trek, all the while pushing the franchise forward. As I well know from Cetacean Observations, one episode alone of Lower Decks could have filled this list. But we're here for the Strange New Worlds crossover. Leg over. <laughs> 
The episode's title is itself an in-joke, Those Old Scientists, a phrase first used by Commander Ransom to describe the 23rd century in no small parts. Then, when Boimler and Mariner are flung through a time portal to said century, they both basically become two excited fans at the greatest ever Star Trek convention. Actors Jack Quaid and Tawny Newsome even took selfies on set during their own time. It's Ensign Boimler with the Riker manoeuvre in the ready room, however, that will surely go down, up and over, as the in-joke to end all in jokes. In universe, Boimler briefly served with the animated Riker on the Titan. On the set of Those Old Scientists, Jonathan Frakes was directing and Quaid improvised the Riker leg swing pike saddle moment in front of him. Number 6. Smoothing things over. The Klingons have gone through many, many changes since their original appearance in Errand of Mercy. At first conceived by writer Gene L. Kuhn as the Soviet half of his Cold War allegory, core actor John Kalikos reportedly looked more to the likes of Genghis Khan for inspiration for the character, leading to some fairly problematic makeup choices. They certainly didn't have the budget in the original series that they did by the time the Klingons reared their ridges in the motion picture. The makeup and general look was further designed and redesigned in the films with Klingons that follow then again and again in The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, with no explanation given. As Michael Dorn knowingly commented in an interview with Cinefantastique, Volume 32, Numbers 4 and 5, I guess they never thought they'd have to deal with it on screen at some point. Therein lies the in-joke when DS9 decided to tackle the changes in Klingon appearance head-on, ish, in Trials and Tribulations. If you can't put ridges on it, hang a lantern on it instead. Worf's laconic, it is a long story, we do not discuss it with outsiders, was all about the answer we needed, and probably the only one we're going to get until the Enterprise explanation, which everybody loved and there's been no problems about since. Number 5. Who writes for Morn? We all know Morn, the famously loose-lipped Lorien with a liking for Jumja sticks, a small fortune in one of his stomachs, and his own seat at Quark's bar. His name alone is an in-joke. Morn is an anagram of Norm, the permanent patron of Cheers. The character's reputation as a chatty Cathy might well precede him, but of course, Morn never actually had any lines. This was far from the plan for Morn from the beginning, however. According to the making of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, on the very first day of filming for Emissary, the man beneath the then nameless Morn mask, Mark Allen Shepard, was asked by director David Carson to tell the funniest joke in the universe. And he did. We won't spoil it for you, but it involves a coconut concertina cosmological argument and a honeysuckle garbage poultry rimfire. Morn made it into the pilot, but evidently the joke did not. Later, lines that were planned for the character were written out before shooting. Eventually, it was far funnier for the great raconteur to say nothing at all, becoming what is certainly one of Star Trek's longest running inside jokes, especially when you take into account the Cerritos' season 3 stop at Deep Space Nine. Number 4. Okudograms. We owe graphic designers Michael and Denise Okuda a great deal for the look lore and feel of Star Trek from the voyage home onwards, not to forget the Star Trek encyclopedia through four editions, the Next Generation Technical Manual, and other reference books that have become veritable fan bibles. Creator of the computer screen and console graphics for Star Trek IV and the Elkar's designs for the Next Generation and beyond, Michael Okuda's instantly recognisable work was lovingly nicknamed the Okudagram. An artistic marvel in their own right, Okudagrams have also provided plenty of opportunities for a good in-joke or two, often never intended to be visible on screen and mostly replaced in the remasterings. For example, Troy's search for a family tree in the neutral zone pre-remaster gives some very interesting results, including the first six actors to have played the Doctor in Doctor Who, Miss Piggy, and Kermit T. Frog. The Okudogram of the Enterprise D's engineering master display features, if you stare hard enough, a duck, a mouse, an airplane, a car, a nomad. Usually covered up for filming, these additions even made it into HD at around 38 minutes and 35 seconds of the remastered Galaxy's Child. Technically, that makes them canon. Number 3. Great Birds of the Galaxy in the far future, Miles O'Brien was, and will be, rightly in statute as perhaps the most important person in Starfleet history. Right along there with him was the less glowingly remembered Brad Boimler. History has its own effect. On Boimler's forever memorialised left arm was one of the great birds of the galaxy, an in-joke which has a history in itself. You might well know by now that THE great bird of the galaxy was Gene Roddenberry, or rather it was the nickname given to him by producer Robert Justman early in the run of the original series. In point of 
artifact. In The Man Trap, Sulu says to Janus Rand, May the great bird of the galaxy bless your planet. The epithet for Star Trek's creator certainly caught on. By the time of The Next Generation, the bird began to make an appearance in graphic form. For Roddenberry's 60th birthday gift in 1987, senior Next Generation illustrator Andrew Probert painted a full-colour Roddenberry-headed bird of the galaxy with command uniform plumage, com badge and NCC-1701 nacelles as tail feathers. A green Okudogram sketch version of the painting was then used on screen as part of the rapid computer searches carried out by Data in The Naked Now and Conspiracy. Number 2. Tubes of Jeffries Walter Matthew Matt Jeffries, his full name is of importance later, is the man well known for designing the original Enterprise model, now so iconic it hangs in the Smithsonian. Jeffries was also largely responsible for the majority of the Enterprise's interior design, as well as that of the shuttlecraft, the Klingon D7 cruiser, the hand phaser, and a plethora of other props, sets, and landscapes. As shown in the Star Trek sketchbook, the original series, Jeffries equally designed what he called the engineering power shaft in his sketch for the enemy within. As he recalled, we needed a space where Scotty could fix things without taking up too much room, so I made a tube with all kinds of complicated looking stuff in it. Somebody hung the name Jeffrey's tube on it, and the name stuck. And stick it did, but only behind the scenes on TOS. It wasn't until the Next Generation Season 3 episode The Hunted that the term Jeffrey's tube was set on screen. On TOS, designers also liked to add the label GNDN for Goes Nowhere Does Nothing to the pipes on Jeffrey's tube sets. In canon, it is generally accepted that the famous crawlways were named after NX project designer of the 22nd century, W. M. Jeffries. Number 1. The Writer and the Principal Far Beyond the Stars will forever be considered one of the best Star Trek episodes ever made. Powerhouse performances from the cast, from Avery Brooks in particular who also directed, and the episode's brilliant narrative conceit bring the theme of racial prejudice and its harrowing consequences into sharp focus in a manner never before managed so directly in Star Trek. The episode is also notable for its use of insider references. The 1950s style drawing of Deep Space Nine that inspires Benny Russell to write his story in the first place was a nice touch, and you perhaps noticed the original series matte painting of Star Base 11 on the cover of competitor magazine Galaxy. For Benny Russell's group of writers' own publication, Incredible Tales of Scientific Wonder, the front cover of the March 1953 edition sports an image of Delta Vega from Where No Man Has Gone Before. The issue then features the stories First of a New Series, The Cage by E. W. Roddenberry, The Corbomite Maneuver by Jerry Soule, illustrated by Matt Jeffries, Journey to Babel by DC Fontana, Metamorphosis by Jean L. Kuhn, and Where No Man Has Gone Before by Samuel P. Finally, in a memo from editor Douglas Pabst to Herbert Rossoff, being played by Armin Zimmerman, apparently used as set dressing but never visible on screen, was written, No one would believe that a cheerleader can kill vampires. The snide Principal Snyder might also have been but a writer's dream. Hello, I'm Duncan Rillick, no relation, and my friend Sean Blast has been rushed to Starfleet Medical, so he's asked me to tell you about Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to build your own fantastic website, like he did for GTN. Its state-of-the-art template designer allows you to build what works best for you. Anyone can use it, even people like me, who may not be the sharpest typo in the spanner box. If you would like to try this deal, you should go to squarespace.com forward slash trekculture and you get 10% off your first purchase. Cheap cheap, when you go, tell them Rillick sent you. No relation. Good luck, Sean Blass. Hope everything goes okay with the toenail. That's everything for our list. Do you reckon we missed any in here? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much to Jack Kiley for writing the original article that this is based on. You can check that out on whatculture.com. Make sure you're following us over on Twitter at Trek Culture, on Instagram at Trek Culture YT, on Blue Sky at Trek Culture, and TikTok at Trek Culture as well. Make sure that you are subscribed. We are getting very, very close to 300,000 subscribers, you absolute legends. You can follow myself at Sean Ferrick on the various socials as well. Until I'm talking to you again, look after yourself, stay safe, Stay calm and stay logical if you can. You are awesome and wonderful. Thanks very much. Bye.